Actually, uh, testing. Is the homework up here? Uh, it's back there. Yep. Yes. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we are recording at this time. Uh, no, I just wanted you to notice that I did post the recording for Monday. All of the recordings should be posted now. I just wanted you to also notice that the drawings that we made, a lot of students were asking me if they could get a copy of it. I actually scanned it, and all three of them are GI, GQ, GS, are actually uh, on your Canvas website now. So if you want to take a look at that, uh, that's the exact drawing that we actually did on Monday. Um, so again, for those that just came in, uh, I did print out problem set number three for you, um, if you haven't printed it out yet. I did postpone the due date until next Wednesday. It's the last problem set due before exam one. Uh, if you weren't here on Monday, I did make the announcement that the exam, first exam, is postponed until Friday, February 21st. Okay? February 21st. Uh, again, the homework Problem set number three is not due until next Wednesday the 19th. All right. Uh, I also had a couple of students actually ask me if I could organize a study group. Um, I don't mind staying after on Wednesday and Friday doing a little chalk talk. I did this last Friday. Today I can do the same thing. So if you have any questions about problem set number two, I can definitely stay after and help you through those problem sets. Okay. I have a good probably 40 minutes before I have to get back. Uh, are there any questions or comments about the exam, about the problem sets, anything like that? Pretty good? All right, well, let's start off with the top hat question then. All right, so there's just a couple of questions. I already have it set up here. A couple of the questions from last Monday's lecture, we talked about receptors, and specifically we jumped into G protein coupled receptors, but um, we talked about a few other ones as well. So, true or false, some receptors act as a ligand gated ion channel. Let's talk about that. Is this true or false? Some receptors act as a ligand gated ion channel. All right, we already have 80 students or so that have answered, so I'll give you about 10 more seconds. All right. Uh, is does anyone in this room need a little more time? Okay. Give you a couple more seconds here. We will have one other too. So just give me a thumbs up when you're ready. You having trouble over here? You're good. All right. Okay, so close, and the correct response is true. All right. So um, most of you got that right. 97% of you got that right. Uh, sometimes receptors are ion channels. So the classic example is the nicotinic acetylcholine receptors. We'll learn about this when we get to skeletal muscle. All right, so we'll revisit this when we get to skeletal muscle for exam two. So I do want to roll out a new term, though. Okay, I'll go to the document camera. If a receptor is an ion channel, just like the previous question, this is called an ionotropic receptor. All right, so if a receptor is an ion channel. So when the ligand binds to the receptor, it opens up a channel. That's called ionotropic. Ion kind of gives that away, right? 
It actually allows for ions to move across the membrane. Now, we concentrated on G protein coupled receptors on Monday. Those types of receptors are called metabotropic receptors. These are G protein coupled receptors. And if I didn't say this before, G protein coupled receptors were characterized by Robert Lefkowitz, who just recently won the Nobel Prize in the last 10 years for his work on G protein coupled receptors. Okay? Uh, any questions about these two terms, ionotropic and metabotropic? So, two new terms, just want to roll those out, kind of layer on top of what you learned on Monday. All right, one more top hat question. Let's go back to our, our top hat. All right, uh, which G protein coupled receptor increases the level of calcium within the cell? This is more of the type of question that you might see on the exam. If you want to talk to your neighbors, you can. However, during the exam, you won't be able to do that. <laughs> Darn. <laughs> All right, we're already up to 92 students. Give you about 10 more seconds. All right, does anyone in this room need a little more time? Peek around the column here. Sometimes it's hard to see that table number one. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and close this and the correct answer is GQ. All right, so um, this is the type of question. Most of you got that right. It's GQ coupled receptors that actually uh, activate PLC. PLC is an enzyme that converts PIP2 into DAG and IP3. IP3 actually goes intracellularly, dives into the inside of the cell, and it activates receptors on the smooth ER, which allows for calcium to be released from internal stores, flooding the intracellular space with calcium. Okay? So a type of question, just think about this for a minute. A type of question could be a drug, X, activates PLC, okay? What would it do to calcium inside the cell? What would it do to G protein coupled the alpha subunit? So you should be able to say if it's targeting PLC, it should activate PLC and calcium should rise within the cell. However, upstream from PLC, there should be no effect. Does that make sense? No effect upstream from where that drug is targeting the pathway. Okay, so just some things to think through. Just want to make sure that you understand what type of question I'm going to ask. So because of that type of question, you do need to know the players for each pathway. You need to know the order that they're in. But it's not essay or short answer. So you don't need to memorize phospho, title, inositol, 4,5-bisphosphate, which is PIB2. You don't need to memorize that. Okay? All right. So let's continue on. Today what we're going to do is we're actually going to concentrate on more cell physiology. Remember cell physiology, the three major themes? We have homeostasis control systems, and forces and flows. So this, even though we talked about G-protein coupled receptors on Monday, I see that as more cell biology, right? Other disciplines are going to be teaching this as well. You'll see this in micro and biochemistry. So that's kind of inherent in all disciplines. But this is more specific to cell physiology. 
So let's continue on. We're going to be talking about, first of all, cell volume regulation. Oh, before I do that, let's just go through this really quickly. Finish this up. This is in your textbook, so you can, it's the G protein coupled receptors. The last one that I think I showed on Monday was the GQ coupled receptor. We went through that uh, as a group. I'm just waiting for this. There we go. Uh, this is GS and GI. Just remember that there is an amplification of the response. Cyclic AMP goes on to activate protein kinase A, which activates multiple enzymes, and that that correlates even more enzymes, could be as much as uh, a million. So you can see how that amplifies the response and there's more of a global response within the cell. Here's the GQ coupled receptor. We talked about this before. I did have a great question after class. Your textbook actually says that IP3 and DAG are the second messengers, but pretty much everything that I've read, a lot of journal articles say that Calcium is actually the second messenger. I would say you could even argue that they're all three second messengers, but calcium is tightly regulated in the cell because it is an important second messenger that's responsible for muscle contraction. So when we get to muscle, I'm going to refer to calcium as a second messenger. Please don't get confused by that. I think it's just a slight, subtle te technicality, really. Okay, so I would also label calcium as an important signaling molecule, an important second messenger. Okay, now when we get to smooth muscle, again, this is for exam two, we're going to learn that intracellular calcium activates other enzymes like calmodulin. This helps smooth muscle cells contract and restrict, uh, decrease the radius of tubes like the small intestines or blood vessels. So calmodulin uh, and calmodulin-dependent kinases are actually important in smooth muscle contraction. Just want to clear that up and, and also elaborate on it a little bit. So now let's talk about cell physiology in particular. We're going to start off with two concepts called regulatory volume increase and regulatory volume decrease. These are mechanisms in place within your cells that help to regulate ho uh, homeostasis of cell volume. Helps to maintain cell volume homeostasis. Okay, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna start off on the right hand side here. On the very far right, you can see on this slide, it says two shrink cells. We didn't already go over this, right? This is new, perfect. All right, two shrink cells. This is called regulatory volume decrease, okay? So you have this, a number of cells right underneath this column, and what's happening is, if you drop a cell into a hypotonic solution, hypotonic, what's gonna happen to that cell? It's gonna swell, absolutely. Uh, let's see, hypo, hippo, right? Um, so that reminds me, I have been putting all of your groups uh, for your um, project, semester long project. You'll maybe notice that you're under people under your project yet. Uh, I will be assigning before Friday your topic, but I really love some of the names, okay? Some of my favorites, there was a hy uh, hypotonic hippos uh, there was Dazed and Diffused, which I thought was really funny. There was another group called the Top Hatters, which I got a good laugh at, <laughs> the Top Hatters. So anyway, they're very clever. I'll tell you about your group names on Friday. Very funny. All right. <laughs> All right. So getting back to the, the slide here. Here are some mechanisms in place. If you drop these cells into a hypotonic solution, they're going to start to swell. And that's going to trigger, there's going to be a stretch of the cytoskeletal elements. It's actually going to trigger mechanically gated channels, right? Mechanically gated channels. 
And what's going to happen, it's going to open these ion channels, specific ones, potassium and chloride. It's going to move solute out. It's also going to increase the activity of a potassium chloride co-transporter. Again, the idea is to move solute out. It also actually increases the activity of a sodium calcium exchanger. Now, the reason why this works is for every turn of this exchanger, two sodium are removed and one calcium is brought into the cell. So the net result is one osmolite out. There's a net transport of one osmolite out. This calcium ATPase is pumping calcium out. And if you increase the activity of our sodium potassium ATPase, the pump, remember it de deserves our respect. If you increase the activity, the net movement again is one osmolite out. Okay, so think about that. When you drop a cell into a hypotonic solution and it begins to swell, there's mechanisms in place to start to remove lots of solute out of the cell, okay? Here's the take home message that you, I want you to remember. Water is going to follow the solute movement. So if you start to remove solute, it's gonna set up an osmotic driving force for the movement of water to follow. That's the take home message. These mechanisms are removing solute as quickly as possible so that water will follow. You can bring the cell volume back to normal range before it lyses and explodes. Okay, so these are mechanisms in place to try to keep cell volume in a specific range in a homeostatic range. And we know a lot of these players. We've talked about ion channels and co-transporters and primary active transporters, like pumps. Okay, so now we're putting a few things together. All right, so let's take a look at the other side. To swell cells, let's just say you drop a cell into a hypertonic solution. One really good example is in the inner medullary region, the real interior of the kidney. Red blood cells have to travel into a very hyperosmotic environment. It goes from about 300 milliosmoles to 1,200 milliosmoles. That is hypertonic. So these red blood cells really start to shrink. They do have mechanisms in place to try to control their cell volume. But imagine that, that's pretty impressive for a cell, for a red blood cell. All right, so what happens in a hypertonic solution? It starts to shrink and you have mechanisms in place to try to swell the cell and bring it back to its normal cell volume. So those cytoskeletal elements in this case open up a sodium channel or a chloride channel if the gradient is the opposite or the membrane potential is a certain voltage. So in this case, chloride and sodium enter into the cell. The water is going to follow that movement, okay? Try to swell the cell. Here is my favorite co-transporter. You're gonna see this again with the kidney. Take a look at this. It's called the sodium potassium two chloride co-transporter. It transports an enormous amount of solute. Okay, so this is actually in the kidney. Anybody uh, horse, horse students in here? Students that really enjoy horses? All right. Um, so you may know something about horses and uh, specifically racehorses. If they start to ha get a nosebleed or after a race, their extremities start to swell, they might get a little bit of edema. A lot of times they'll give a drug called Lasix which makes them pee a lot. Ever heard of the, the term pee like a racehorse, right? That would be due to a racehorse that's been given Lasix. 
Okay, so Lasix actually inhibits this particular co-transporter, causes, it's a powerful diuretic, makes them pee and get rid of a lot of excess fluid in their body. Helps with nosebleeds and edema. Okay, so anyway, we'll talk more about that when we get to the kidney. We'll talk about diuretics. That drug works on this co-transporter. All right, so again, solute is being moved into the cell. Water is going to follow. All right, so I'm going to have you talk to your neighbors. Why does this last one work? We've talked about the sodium proton exchanger before. Why does this one work to try to shrink the cell back to its normal range? They both have a positive charge. They both are transporting just one ion. In fact, it's electroneutral. So remember, you should know that term right now. It's electroneutral. So why does that work? You can talk to your neighbor. It's kind of a brain teaser. All right, anyone want to take a guess? This is a really hard one. So if this was to work, basically the sodium would act as an osmolite, but the proton would not. So what happened to that proton that it's not acting as an osmolite? Turns out you have a lot of buffer in the extracellular side, right? So as soon as that proton is delivered into the extracellular side, it binds to buffer. Okay, it'll bind to a buffer. And then a lot of times it doesn't act as an osmolite. Does that make sense to everyone? Okay, great. Okay, so this is, again, this is about cell volume regulation. These are mechanisms in place to help regulate cell volume and keep them within homeostatic range. Again, very much cell physiology. Remember our three themes, homeostasis, control systems, and forces and flows. All right, so let's take a look at calcium regulation. Another uh, topic within cell physiology. You know something about transporters and channels now, right? So now we're gonna apply it to cell uh, calcium regulation. Okay, so you can see here this red area is the intracellular space and calcium is tightly regulated in cells like neurons and muscle because these are important second messengers right they actually play a, an important role in signaling okay so it's tightly regulated you can see here there are exchangers like the sodium calcium exchanger uses the sodium gradient to remove calcium from the cell. This one is super important in the heart. Okay. The dihydropyridine receptors, you don't need to know that now, but that's going to become very important with skeletal muscle. Calcium floods into the intracellular space, right, after an action potential, and it initiates a rise in calcium, which is responsible for muscle contraction, dihydropyridine receptors. This is ionotropic, right? Because it's a receptor that is an ion channel. All right, there's also pumps, the calcium ATPase. A lot of names are really not that original. This is called the plasma membrane calcium ATPase. <laughs> Okay, so again, primary active transporter uses ATP, or I'm sorry, the hydrolysis of ATP captures that energy and moves molecules against their concentration gradient. Ryanidine receptors are actually channels that allow for calcium to escape from the smooth ER. In muscle, it's called the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And then finally, this calcium ATPase is called the circa pump. It's actually the sarcoplasmic and endoplasmic reticulum calcium ATPase. So very important to realize that calcium is tightly regulated in the cell. 
Free extracellular calcium is about one millimolar. Free intracellular calcium is about 10 to the minus seventh molar. Okay, so I, that is 100 nanomolar. So very tightly regulated. All right, let's talk an, about another topic now. How does the cell regulate intracellular pH? All right, again, it's all about homeostasis, control systems, and forces and flows. All right, so this is a little bit more difficult to understand, to read. I'm glad you're here today. I'll go through it really slowly. If you have any questions, just kind of come on up after class. So what you'll notice is we're going to take a look at this from the left-hand side first. This is intracellular pH. Just remember pH is a measure of free proton levels. pH is a measure of free hydrogen ion levels. And the normal pH within the cell is usually about 7.2. Okay? So if you follow my arrow, if you're actually looking at the slide at this point, the way to read this is as the pH falls, so it's getting lower and lower, you're going down this box, you're starting to accumulate hydrogen, free hydrogen ions within the cell, right? pH is dropping. As pH drops, that means the inside of the cell is becoming more acidic. Right? Now remember, this box is actually depicting a cell itself. And inside the cell, you have lots of buffers, bicarbonate, phosphates, and proteins. Now, when you overwhelm the buffering capacity, that's when you get free proton levels. OK? So we're accumulating free hydrogen ion levels. pH is falling. We're going down the box here. What it does is it actually activates sodium proton exchanger. Sodium proton exchanger. It activates it. Okay, so let's take a look at that on the document camera. I'm gonna draw a cell. Sometimes it's easy to see visually. If you activate the sodium proton exchanger, looks like this. If the cell is becoming more acidic, there's a mechanism in place to increase the activity of the sodium proton exchanger. Uses the sodium gradient to start to remove protons from the cell, helping it bring the cell back up to 7.2 pH, bring it back to homeostatic range. You rev up, you increase the activity of the sodium proton exchanger. Does that make sense? All right. Gets a little sticky, this next one. So you increase, we're at the bottom of the slide, you increase the sodium proton exchanger. It removes free protons from the cell, and it helps to bring the cell back up to 7.2, an intracellular pH of 7.2. Let's go the other way. All right, now the inside of the cell is, uh, the pH is increasing. You're getting a decrease of free proton levels. So it makes sense the first thing you would do is inhibit the sodium proton exchanger. If you do that, protons are going to actually start to accumulate in the cell. It'll help bring the pH back down to normal. However, you also increase the activity of another exchanger called the chloride bicarbonate exchanger. Okay. Let's let me show you how that works. Okay, I'm going to switch over to the document camera. Now the pH is rising. We want to try to bring it back down to normal. So what we do first is we decrease the activity of the sodium proton exchanger. You'll start to accumulate protons inside the cell. That would work. 
but also you could use the chloride gradient to remove bicarbonate from the inside of the cell. What does that do if you increase the activity of the chloride bicarbonate exchanger? The simple answer here is as you remove your buffer, if you remove your buffer, you're going to actually increase free proton levels within the cell. That will help to increase free proton levels by removing your buffer, some of your buffer. So I'll just write that here. This is a buffer, an intracellular buffer. Pretty good? All right, so if we go back, you can actually see two mechanisms are triggered if the pH rises beyond normal range. You inhibit the sodium proton exchanger and you increase the activity of the chloride bicarbonate exchanger. Both of those help to bring the pH back down to normal around 7.2. All right, pretty good. So. One of the last things I want to talk about are I to talk about epithelial cells because they're one of the most important cell types when we're looking at the function of different or organs like the lung, like the kidney. Okay, so get this one going. Any questions so far about uh, the previous three slides? Cell physiology, again, really good. Physiology, looking at homeostasis, control systems, and forces and flows. So here's our roadmap. We've already talked about uh, cell volume regulation, regulation of intracellular calcium, intracellular pH regulation, and now we're at the end here, epithelial transport. Then we're going to start with neurons on Friday. So, epithelial cells are basically the barrier between the outside world and the inside of your body. So let's just take your lungs for instance. When you breathe in air, the air goes all the way into the interior of your lungs, right? And those epithelial cells are basically the cell type that the air encounters first. So again, epithelial cells are the boundary between the external world and the inside of an animal's body. Okay, again, we'll be talking about this. It has a lot of different physiological functions, respiration, digestion, ion, and water regulation, osmoregulation. So we're gonna be talking about it with lungs, intestines, and tubules called nephrons in the kidney. All right. To start off with epithelial cells, there are three different types of epithelial cells. Some are flat sheets like your skin, like your epidermis. They don't have a huge transport property. They're not real active in transport. But they are the barrier between the outside world and the inside of your body. Flat sheets. Also, if you were, are taking the lab, if you used a toothpick and you scraped the inside of your cheek, those are also flat sheets, epi uh, epithelial cells. The second type are tubules. These are very um, present. We're going to see this a lot when we talk about the nephron in the kidneys. These are tubules. They look like this. They form cylinders, right? Epithelial cells, they are kind of surrounding these particular, they're a structure that forms a cylinder. All right, so you can see here, once these epithelial cells become in contact with each other, they can become polarized, meaning they start to sort different proteins to different sides. The side that face, faces the lumen is called the luminal side. It's also called the apical side. And I'll formally roll this out in just a minute. 
So the side that actually faces the interior of the cavity is called the apical side. The other side that faces the blood supply is called the basolateral side. It's also called the serosal side because it faces the blood. So again, different proteins can be sorted to different sides once these epithelial cells become in contact with each other and form what's called tight junctions. Okay? So those are structures called tubules. I'm going to go back to this one. Just talked about flat sheets and tubules, but now I'm going to give you some information about glands. Okay? The simplest gland is in the small intestines. It's called the crypts. They're just U-shaped. Okay? They do a lot of secretion. Lots of fluid is secreted and then delivered on the interior of the intestines within the tube. So they're in the small intestines and the colon. The second type of gland is an acinar gland. These are salivary glands and mammary glands. And you can actually see here, it's represented by number two here. It has two portions, a acinar portion, which is the bulb part, and a duct portion. Now, when you're actually doing CFTR, your homework assignment, this is going to help you when I talk about acinar gland glands in just a second. And then there are other types of glands called endometrial glands. They're very complex. That's number three here, the diagram. They can be branched or coiled. They can actually even coil. So they're much more complicated. All right, so also I want to talk about the difference between an exocrine gland and an endocrine gland. This is a typical acinar gland that I just talked about. It has an acinous portion here, the bulb, and a duct portion. Now with an exocrine gland, it delivers secretions to the external environment, like the inside of a tube. Or sweat glands deliver secretions to the outside of the body, onto the skin. Those are exocrine glands. Endocrine glands here, you can see these are cells that deliver molecules directly into the circulatory system. So hormones, right? Hormones, a lot of them come from endocrine glands, delivers the hormone directly into the circulatory system. Now, some of the junctions between these epithelial cells, including junctions, include tight junctions, so when a cell comes into contact with each other, you can see here is cell A on the left, cell B on the right. The tight junctions actually help to uh, contact. They come into contact with each other. They form tight junctions. That's the signal to start polarization. Now it allows for the cell to sort different proteins either to the apical side or the basal lateral side. Septate junctions are a little bit tighter. Even more, a stronger junction is called the desmosome. These are called spot welds. You can see that includes glycoprotein filaments, which are attached to cytoskeletal elements. And then finally here, gap junctions. It's a really good test question, by the way. Gap junctions are really important in the heart. They're made up of six connexin proteins that come together for in each cell to create a hemichannel. And then two hemichannels come together when the cells come into contact with each other to form a pore. So this allows like cardiac muscle cells, when one cell depolarizes, the depolarization wave goes from cell to cell to cell. It usually allows for monovalence, like cations, to move from one interior of the cell to the next without even going into the extracellular fluid. So again, this allows if the depolarization wave can go from cell to cell to cell within the heart, it helps to create a condition where you get a coordinated heartbeat 
to propel blood out of that organ. Gap junctions, really, really important in the heart. So formal definition, gap junctions are specialized protein complexes that create an aqueous pore between two adjacent cells. Chemical messengers like cations can travel from the signaling cell to the target cell without ever entering into the extracellular environment. And it usually involves ions. Okay, two more important uh, terms. Transcellular means when ions or molecules move through the cell. Paracellular, when ions move in between the cells, right across the tight junctions. Para means next to. All right, so we only have a few more minutes. Um, these are just some nice images of glands and epithelial cells. What I'm going to do is I'm actually going to draw, I'm going to put a lot of concepts together here for you, okay? So let's go to this one right here. All right. Just remember, once these cells grow together like this, this is a really nice image, tight junctions are going to form, and you can sort different transporters. These green ones are going to the apical side. Here's where it's labeled apical membrane. And these pink transporters are going to the opposite membrane, the basal lateral membrane. So following the formation of tight junctions, epithelial cells become polarized. All right, take a look at this figure. In our department, anybody know Dr. O'Grady, Scott O'Grady? All right. Um, basically, this is out of his lab, by the way. Um, all right, so it looks very complicated, but you have all the tools to understand this one. I see some bewildered faces. All right, so the top portion is the inside of a gland, all right? This is the serosal side on the bottom part. Okay, if UTP is our ligand, right? You didn't maybe know that UTP was a signaling molecule. What pathway is this initiating? What G protein coupled receptor pathway is this? What's that? It's GQ. That's right. So GQ coupled receptor is activated, PLC is activated, DAG IP3, right? What this does is it actually goes on to activate a chloride channel, which happens to be CFTR, cystic fibrosis transmembrane regulator, PKC activates that. It also increases intracellular calcium and activates calcium activated chloride channels. All right, so this is a GQ coupled receptor. All right, so bear with me. This is my favorite co-transporter that I was just talking about, the sodium-potassium 2-chloride co-transporter. It is the loading step. This is where we start. It loads chloride into the cell, okay? Uh, basically, you get an increase in chloride within the cell. Let's go over to the document camera here. If you increase the intracellular chloride, it actually depolarizes the equilibrium potential for chloride to about minus 17 millivolts. If the outside is about 150 and the inside rises to like 80, all right, chloride. If there's still a huge conductance for potassium, the resting membrane potential be about minus 60 millivolts. When I open up those chloride channels on the apical membrane, which way is chloride going to go? In or out? I open two chloride channels on the apical membrane. Here's my reference. Is the resting membrane potential more negative or more positive? Negative. 
which way is chloride going to be moving? Out. It's going to go out of the cell. Right? So let's go back. Just a little bit of a review. Ha! <laughs> All right. So now we've loaded chloride into the cell. Chloride is now, we've determined, going out of the cell across the apical membrane. Now we have, listen carefully, transcellular movement of chloride. Chloride is moving through the transcellular pathway into the interior of the gland. Okay? Now, notice that actually sets up a voltage gradient across the entire membrane now. So it's more negative in the interior. That's actually going to attract sodium through the paracellular pathway. All right, so let's take a look at this one. Now, this is the interior of the gland, right? We've determined, sorry, chloride is going the transcellular pathway into the interior of the gland. Sodium is following because you have that voltage gradient set up. Sodium is going to follow the paracellular pathway. Now you have all these solutes moving into the interior of the gland. Which way is water going to follow? It's going to go with the solute movement, right? When you talk about glands and you talk about secretions, it's not magic. It's biophysics right? You activate this cell, chloride starts moving through the transcellular pathway, sodium follows across the paracellular pathway, sets up an osmotic driving force for the movement of water to follow, and then you get all of this sodium chloride secretion and fluid movement delivery to the external environment. Now what's really cool is this is actually a positive feedback mechanism. Because what happens when water follows, it stretches the cell, you get more UTP release, it activates more GQ, more chloride secretion, more sodium secretion, more water secretion. It helps to amplify that response. Okay? Pretty cool. Any questions? I love that this brings a lot of things together for us, right? All right, so here's, before you pack up, I want you to think about this when you're doing your cystic fibrosis homework assignment, right? Because what happens if you now inhibit CFTR? You don't get vectoral movement of chloride through the transcellular pathway. Sodium doesn't follow water doesn't follow, and you end up with this mucus plug in a lot of duct cells. All right? All right, everyone. Have a good Thursday. I will see you on Friday where we're going to pick up with the nervous system and neurons. What did you say the class was that you were teaching next semester? Uh, 1701. Is it on Schedule Builder yet? I, I just don't sent... know. Yeah, there it is. Oh, uh, no, that's that art. It. No, it's animal stuff. I don't think it's on there yet. I've talked to Kim Reno about that already. Okay. Hi. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh I, had, I had laryngitis last spring. Oh. Yeah. It's yeah, I'm going to go in now for this to see what Yes. Is. Okay. Um, I'll, just wait for, I'll just figure out what to write. Or like, this is like the business. Like, 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 what the protein does in the channel. Yeah. And really, too, really. Yeah, yeah. Um, this one, one of the ones I was talking about is like RNA treatment. Yeah. Because that's experimental. Can I talk about that there? Even though yeah. it's kind of also. Yes. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Uh, some of the just more normal, I mean, just uh, easy treatments. It's yeah. like the chest yeah. compression. Yeah. Um, you know, my friend Alexis, my friend, she was actually talking about some kind of I haven't read too much about it yet, so I'm looking forward to that. Hi. I emailed you yesterday about okay. seeing the chapter class. Oh, sure. Yeah. Alexia. Yep. Okay, great. Is that how you pronounce it? Yeah. Perfect. Okay, great. Uh, let me just turn this off. All right. It takes so long for this to shut.
to come I'm, up and shut down. Melissa, okay. I've been meaning to ask you, does yes. the 